apocalyptic scenes in the Democratic Republic of Congo after a volcano erupts, triggering a massive evacuation. The lava flow stopping less than a mile from a city of roughly 700,000 people. 17 villages were hit by the lava and at least 600 homes destroyed. Tonight, at least 15 people are dead and hundreds of children are feared missing. Closer to normal, COVID cases in America plunging tonight to their lowest levels in almost a year. This has a weekend of sporting events showing off what a new vaccinated normal might look like. What goes through your mind when you see those large gatherings? It actually makes me feel a lot of joy. State-sponsored hijacking? EU member Belarus facing major backlash and sanctions tonight after forcing the diversion of a passenger jet to arrest a prominent critic of the country's authoritarian leader. And in the Middle East tonight, a fragile ceasefire holds between Israel and Hamas. Top diplomat Secretary of State Tony Blinken headed to the region. How can the U.S. help after 11 days of violence? Our Matt Gutman in Israel once again. Tonight, our conversation with Arizona Secretary of State on the Republican-led efforts in her state to conduct audits on the 2020 election despite no evidence of fraud. The folks leading this effort, they know that this is not going to overturn the 2020 election. And the incredible story of hardship, then hope. The moment 50 years in the making for this deaf mother that might have once seemed impossible. I want to hug her. I want to hug you so bad. Good evening, I'm Janae Norman in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you for streaming with us. We begin tonight with promising news on the pandemic after perhaps the most normal weekend in the U.S. in more than a year. Packed cheering sections of fans at arenas across the country, a sign of hope and promise of the vaccine. 15,000 fans inside New York's Madison Square Garden, the state's largest indoor gathering since the pandemic began. And gathering like these possible in more and more states as Americans get vaccinated and COVID cases plunged to their lowest levels in almost a year. Cases down 90% since January to less than 25,000 a day. The CDC tonight is investigating reports of a heart problem in more than a dozen teenagers and young people out of millions of shots administered. Our Steve Osinsami leads us off from Atlanta. This tonight is what the end of the pandemic is starting to look like. For the first time, more than 15,000 fans at a basketball game in Madison Square Garden, the largest indoor event in New York State since the pandemic. People who could prove they were vaccinated didn't need to wear masks. New York, we're here! From the NBA playoffs to the links at the PGA Championship, from graduations to parades, the vaccines are helping to get life in America back to normal. It's been a whole year we haven't been able to come out and celebrate. The average number of new COVID cases that were as high as 250,000 a day in January is now below 25,000 new cases a day, a 90% difference. New York State says it will fully reopen public schools in the fall. One million kids will be back in their classroom in September, all in person, no remote. But the CDC tonight says it is investigating reports that a very small number of young people who've been vaccinated have developed a condition called myocarditis, an inflammation of the heart. The symptoms were usually mild, went away on their own, and were seen in more than a dozen teens or young adults, usually men, about four days after getting their second dose of the Moderna or Pfizer vaccine. Doctors are on the lookout tonight for fatigue or shortness of breath, but they point out that these are still only a tiny fraction of the more than 130 million people in this country who've been fully vaccinated without any issues. They are trying to investigate to see if they're related um, at all to the vaccine. At this point, there is no relationship proven. As the world recovers, there are growing calls for a deeper investigation into how the coronavirus got its start. The Wall Street Journal is reporting new details about three workers from the Wuhan Institute of Virology who had to be treated for COVID-like symptoms in November of 2019, about three weeks before health officials believe the outbreak in China began. It's not clear if the three workers actually came down with the disease. Investigators from the World Health Organization have said it's extremely unlikely that the virus spread after a leak from a lab, but they also say that the Chinese government didn't give their investigators full access to information. I think that we should continue to investigate 
what went on in China until we find out to the best of our ability exactly what happened. I'm perfectly in favor of any investigation that looks into the origin of the virus. And our thanks. And for more now, we bring in Dr. Richard Besser, former CDC acting director and CEO of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Thanks so much for coming on tonight, Dr. Besser. You've led the CDC and you're also a pediatrician. How concerned are you about the heart problems found in more than a dozen teenagers and young people after receiving the COVID vaccine? And what do parents need to know at this time? Well, you know, Janae, at this point, it, it gives me confidence in the in the in the system. You know, the the vaccines have been rolled out now, and there have been more than three million people, 16 and younger, who've who've had the vaccines. And there's a committee that looks at the safety data every week, and when they see a signal, they have to ask the question: Well, is what we're seeing something more common than we would normally expect? And right now, they they think that these cases of myocarditis or heart inflammation are not occurring more frequently than they normally would. Unfortunately, this is something you do see in, in children and adults. But it's important that they stop and they ask the question. They look to see, are there more cases of this? Could it be really related to vaccination? At this point, they don't think that, that it is, um, but it's always important that they're looking. Yeah, so important to keep those things in mind. And we're, of course, seeing those images of huge crowds really all around the country with so many feeling like we've reached a real turning point in this pandemic after such a long time. What goes through your mind when you see those large gatherings? I was outside of Madison Square Garden yesterday reporting live with all of the fans. Does that make you nervous or how do you feel when you see that? Um, it, it actually makes me feel a lot of joy. You know, the idea that we've got three vaccines right now that are safe and effective against a disease that, that's only been around for a year is, is almost miraculous. And it tells me if you're fully vaccinated, so two weeks after your final dose, you can get back to a lot of the things in life that you love. And that's terrific because we saw a lot of people at Madison Square Garden who love basketball having a great time. If you're not vaccinated, you want to keep that mask on. And you said you felt joy. That might be contagious because don't you think people who might have been hesitant to get vaccinated, seeing all those images of the packed arenas, people having fun, do you think they might be starting to think that it might be worth getting a shot? I, I think so, and, and I hope so. I, you know, what we're seeing is the more people have friends and family members they know who've been vaccinated, the the demand the end is is increasing. So those people who are on the fence, they're getting much more used to this. And I think scenes like the ones that that you you were sharing are the kinds of things that that are going to help more people decide. All right, I want to go ahead and get this. And, and back to children real quick. New York City schools, among others, are preparing to be entirely in person this fall. Do you think that that's the right call? Do you think schools should look like? What do you think they should look like next year, especially as some kids still are not able to get vaccinated? Yeah, I think for the for the very young kids, it's going to depend what's going on around the country, and they're likely going to still be using masks. But if New York City has been able to ensure that the ventilation is is proper in those classrooms, getting kids back into school for in-person learning is so important. It's been a real challenge in terms of education, in terms of physical and emotional health, having kids kids at home. And black and brown kids who tend to be in school districts that, that haven't been able to do as much to improve the facilities have suffered much more. So I'm glad to see this coming. And getting those kids back in school will likely have a positive impact on their mental health as well. Dr. Besser, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's a real pleasure. Now to the urgent manhunt for the gunman who killed a six-year-old boy in a deadly freeway shooting in Southern California. The boy was sitting in the back seat with his mother behind the wheel. Authorities believe a man and a woman were in the other car. Here's ABC's Kaylee Hartung. Tonight, an urgent search for clues after six-year-old Aiden Leos was shot and killed in the back seat of his mother's car as she drove him to kindergarten. They took my son's life away. And he was beautiful and he was kind and he was precious. And you killed him for no reason. Police calling it a case of road rage, now asking for driver dash cams, looking for any signs of the suspected white sedan on Southern California Freeway 55 Friday morning. Someone pulled out a gun and shot my little brother in the stomach. And he said, Mommy, my, my tummy hurts. A single bullet piercing the trunk, officials say striking Aiden in the back in his booster seat. There was a car behind me. 
that cut me off abruptly. And as I started to merge away from them, I heard a really loud noise. The young boy fatally wounded. I pulled over and I took him out of the car. And I, I tried to put my hand on his wounds while calling 911. He's losing a lot of blood. Joanna Clunan says a woman was driving the white car with a man in the passenger seat. I want to find them and I want there to be justice to be served for my son. And Kaylee, that is just a horrific story. You can hear the pain in that mother's voice. Kaylee Hartung joins us now. Kaylee, what is the latest from officials as they try to track down the suspected shooter? Well, Janae, police are asking for the public's help. They say they have received tips and they're following them, but we don't know that they have any suspects just yet. The focus is on getting witnesses to come forward who may have had dashboard cameras in their vehicle who were in this area on Friday morning. And Janae, you can see this memorial growing behind me just above the freeway. People continuing to come here to honor Aiden's life. And now his family is offering a $50,000 reward for anyone who may have information that could lead to an arrest. Janae. Heartbreaking story. Hopefully they get answers soon. Kaylee, thank you so much. And now we bring in ABC's chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas, who's been tracking the recent surge of gun violence in this country. Pierre, thank you for joining us. You have been following this latest data on gun violence, and it's showing a really stunning surge. Well, we looked at the numbers from just this past weekend alone, Janae, and we found that in the last 72 hours, 130 people have been killed and more than 400 have been wounded. That's just in the last 72 hours. Those are incredibly shocking numbers. And Pierre, speaking of this weekend, we reported on a mass shooting at a house party in New Jersey. What are authorities telling us tonight? They're still gathering information, but they're saying that this was not some random attack. It appears to be a targeted assault on that house party with the victims being intended. And Pierre, before we let you go, do your sources have any insights or even guesses as to why we are seeing these shocking spikes in gun violence at this time? You know, it's hard for them to say. All they know is that the surge began really in about 2018. Uh, we saw a more than 30 percent increase between 2018 and 2020. And if you look at 2020's numbers, Janae, it was 4,000 more people killed as related to gun violence in 2020 than in 2019. Stunning. And that means so many families impacted by this as well. Pierre, thank you so much. Well, next to the fragile ceasefire between Israel and Hamas that continues to hold, Secretary of State Tony Blinken is traveling to the region tomorrow as the concerns about a potential humanitarian crisis in Gaza continues to grow. Matt Gutman spent the last few days inside Gaza, but he's reporting from Tel Aviv tonight. Tonight, Hamas defiant, parading down the streets of Gaza this weekend for the first time since fighting with Israel began two weeks ago. And with Israeli tanks trucked back to their bases, Secretary of State Tony Blinken headed to the region today. We have to deal with making this turn from the violence. We've got the ceasefire uh, and now uh, deal with the humanitarian situation. The U.S. hoping to freeze Hamas from incoming humanitarian aid. But as we found out, driving an hour south of Gaza City to an area where Hamas was seen exhuming the bodies of militants from its bombed out network of tunnels, the group is very much in control. As soon as we got out of the car, our Palestinian producer got a call telling us we cannot be here and we basically just got kicked out. And everywhere, collateral damage. <laughs> Dunya Asalia's daughter, Dima, was killed by an explosion last week right outside their house. <laughs> Dunya tells me an Israeli drone killed her daughter, but the Israeli military tells us it never targeted that location. Dima was buried last week, and her scent is the most precious thing her mother has left. She tells me it brings her comfort. It still clings to her pillow and her blanket, and Dunya clings to them. And Matt Gutman joins us again. Matt, you spent the weekend in Gaza. You're now back in Israel. Give us a sense on how Palestinians view this latest conflict now that it's over in comparison to the Israelis and what that could mean moving forward. 
You know, Jenny, the operative term you used is the latest conflict. What unites Israelis and Palestinians, and there aren't that many things upon which they agree, but that this is the latest conflict. There will be another round. The question is when. How long will this quiet last? Now, these Egyptian negotiators, um, uh, Secretary Blinken in the region, trying to create a longer-lasting ceasefire at this point between Israel and Hamas. The question is, again, how much time does it buy? Um, another question is, you know, can the U.S. progress towards a two-state solution, which we've heard President Biden talk about, Secretary Blinken, and everybody across the board, in stark contrast to what it was like with the Trump administration, but can they get this done without engaging Hamas in Gaza? Um, nobody knows the answer to that. I'll tell you what they say in Gaza. There's no way that you can have any sort of truce, peace, long-lasting ceasefire without talking to the people who were elected in 2006 and are in control of the territory that is most hostile to you. So so these are questions that the administration is going to face. And again, I think everybody both in Israel and in the West Bank and Gaza is asking the same questions. How can this move forward? Um, right now, but nobody knows. And, and Matt, to that point, what you were just speaking about, about Secretary of State Blinken traveling to the region, as you said, he's hoping to try to extend this ceasefire. But explain why that may not necessarily help. So he'll be meeting with uh, Israeli officials, uh, Palestinian officials in Ramallah. They're part of the Palestinian Authority, which really controls the West Bank. Um, and that is the governing body which the United States and Israel um, recognize and want to deal with, or at least the U.S. wants Israel to deal with. Um, but it does not control the Gaza Strip. So not engaging Hamas is something that's perplexing. It is a dilemma that the administration is going to have to deal with. Uh, Secretary Blinken also meeting with Egyptian and Jordanian officials. The, Egyptian have, the Egyptians have been absolutely critical in mediating this ceasefire. And we are told that Israeli and Hamas officials will be meeting at the same time in Cairo, uh, though not directly negotiating with one another, um, along with Egyptian mediators to try to hash out the exact parameters of this ceasefire, which we don't know yet. Um, you know, and you mentioned what Israelis and Palestinians are thinking about. The other question is, when is this going to blow up, and what is the threshold for this ceasefire to blow up? What is it going to take? Is it some sort of mass protest in Jerusalem? Is it one rocket, two rockets, ten rockets fired from Gaza, or one of the other factions in Gaza? Again, at this point, this region is filled with more uncertainty than anything else. Janae. And Matt, you are doing incredible reporting out there on such an important story, and we are grateful to you. Back to this country now and the Republican-led efforts to conduct more audits of the 2020 election in Arizona and Georgia. Arizona's GOP-led Senate has used its subpoena power to obtain more than 2 million 2020 general election ballots in Maricopa County. And in Georgia, a judge has greenlit a fourth count of absentee ballots in Fulton County. This comes as former President Donald Trump and his loyalists continue to make false claims that the 2020 race was stolen. For more context now, we bring in ABC's Devin Dwyer. Devin, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Let's start with a, a very fundamental question. Is there any reason to doubt that President Joe Biden did, in fact, carry Arizona and Georgia in 2020 and that there was not widespread fraud? Well, there are still people, Janae, that have deep doubts, sincerely held doubts about the election results. And as you said, I mean, we are 200 days now past the election. There have been counts recounts, audits, re-audits in both of those states you mentioned, and no widespread fraud uncovered at all. In fact, both states' Republican governors, as we've said many times, certified those results. They still stand by them today. Uh, but of course, President Trump, still a major figure in the Republican par Party, keeps fanning these flames. And that's why we see these states conducting yet another round of 2020 audits. And we'll be speaking with Arizona Secretary of State Katie Hobbs after this. But, Devin, give us your take on what's happening right now with the Arizona election audit. Well, you know, Janae, Arizona Senate Republicans authorized this latest count. They said they wanted to put to rest the doubts once and for all in that state. But I got to tell you, what is going on in Arizona is raising more questions than answers uh, for many reporters looking at this from the outside. The private company that they hired to conduct the count, it's called Cyber Ninjas. Uh, they've never worked on elections before. We still don't know who is paying them entirely, who is working there. Uh, and on top of that, Janae, it's not entirely clear what they hope to find. 
made. The audit that's going on in Arizona right now can't change the election results, um, as many state officials have said. So. As the Maricopa County uh, recorder, a top Republican official, told us here earlier today on ABC News Live, he said there's no evidence to support what they are doing. All of the previous tests have come back clear, and so he worries that this process that's going on right now might sow perpetual doubt about future elections in Arizona, a real concern. And that's what I was going to say, certainly will not help instill confidence in election integrity. And what about the latest on the Georgia audit? There have been three audits in Georgia already, Janae. We're about to get a fourth. A state judge just on Friday uh, said a number of, of, of state officials and groups and, and voters who have raised concerns can get another look at 145,000 absentee ballots in Fulton County. That's the county right around Metro Atlanta. Uh, these voters and groups had concerns about what they said were suspicious activity at a polling place there in November. We still don't know the details yet of how this audit will take place. Place, but another one is coming in Georgia. Even as in Arizona, it cannot change the election results there in that state. Can't change anything, but still another one coming. And finally, Devin, how much support do these efforts have within the larger Republican Party? And what kind of concerns are you hearing from within the GOP? Well, publicly, Janae, down here, you don't hear, in Washington, that is, you don't hear uh, many Republicans raising concerns about these audits, but at the same time, you don't hear them voluntarily uh, bringing them up. The Republican leadership in Congress certainly wants to be moving forward, looking forward, but as long as these public polls show many Republicans still harboring serious doubts about the election, in part fueled by President Trump, they're going to have to address their voting base, and that's why we're seeing a lot of these uh, these investigations continue and probably will for some time, Janae. Really concerning there. Devin, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks, Janae. And we now bring in Arizona Secretary of State Kate Hobbs, a Democrat. Secretary Hobbs, thank you so much for joining us. You oversaw the 2020 general election in your state, and you have repeatedly expressed confidence in those certified results over the nearly seven months since the election. But that audit is still going on. What's the latest with that? And when do you think it'll wrap up? <laughs> well, that's that. Your guess is good as mine on when it's going to wrap up. It seems that the further they drag this on, the more money that they're making from it. And I've heard talk of potentially expanding it to other counties in the state, as well as expanding it to other races on the ballot, which would all make this drag out far too long. Uh, so the audit was on hiatus for a week because of graduations that were taking place in the building that they're utilizing, and it started again today. Uh, we still have the same level of concern that we had going into this uh, with the, just the lack of expertise and accountability and transparency that's going on here, and really nothing we're seeing that is going to produce what would be considered a, a valid result. And when you talk about this effort potentially being expanded to other counties and other races, we know that this is inspired by people who are hoping for a domino effect that could bring former President Trump back to the White House. What if they publicly declare that they found something? What would then be the next step for you? Well, there's there's nothing. And, and the folks leading this effort, they know that this is not going to overturn the 2020 election. They're just hoping to continue to sow those doubts. And they know that they have followers who believe that this actually is going to overturn the election. And that's really, really unfortunate. But the bottom line is that there's there's. The, the, we know the results they come up with are not going to be valid. They're not following any type of procedures that include best practices for a post-election audit or recount of ballots. They're, they're, the, the procedures they are utilizing are fraught with error and really setting up a situation that's prime for cooking the books in terms of the results that they come up with. And, and to that point, uh, you recently asked the county to replace all of the voting machines that were turned over to a private contractor, citing security concerns. Why do you think that that's necessary? Well, and this is not just coming from my office. My office does oversee the certification of election equipment in the state. And um, we, guidance from CISA, who who's, sees, oversees the critical infrastructure, including elections, has said that if the chain of custody of election equipment is lost, meaning it comes out of the hands of certified election officials, that there's grave concerns about 
the, the future use of that equipment, its accuracy and reliability, and we have no way of knowing if it's been tampered with, and there's no process in place that would allow us to have assurance that uh, the equipment could be utilized again. And so what we notified the county is that we would be in a position of having to decertify it. And this is not new information to the county. We told them this up front before um, anything was turned over. And, and this point about replacing voting machines would be really costly to taxpayers. Mm -hmm. And you've said that other secretaries of state are also concerned about the audit in Arizona. What kind of conversations are you having with your counterparts in other states? And are you hearing from Republicans as well as Democrats? Yes, um, I've had several bipartisan meetings with secretaries of state who not only are concerned about this coming to their states, but are hearing from local election clerks that that folks are going around offering to do a, a free audit of the election. And these are people much in line with Cyber Ninjas and other groups that have a vested interest in overturning the election of 2020 and, and undermining election integrity. These are not real election audits. And, you know, hopefully in other states, um, they're watching what's happening in Arizona and able to get in front of this in a way that doesn't allow this kind of of corruption of of our election systems and the ballots and equipment. And, and you just mentioned potentially undermining election integrity. A judge has allowed another audit in Georgia, as we've reported. Are you concerned that these audits are going to undermine the confidence of elections going forward if the losing side just continues month after month to go after and continue to cast doubt without presenting even any evidence? You're, you're exactly right there. And, and the bottom line is that the, 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 the level of confidence in our elections, the folks who lack the confidence, it's because of these people who continue to perpetuate the big lie and continue to, to promote these evidence-free claims that there was widespread fraud, fraud when we know that there wasn't. And the way to regain election integrity and, and, and is to for them to stop doing this and for other elected leaders to stand up to them and, and tell the truth about our elections. And that's exactly what I wanted to ask you. How do we end this? How do we move forward? And you said you think that the, the folks who are trying to continue these audits need to stop and other election officials need to speak up, essentially. Absolutely. And not just election officials, but elected officials as a whole. There's a lot of elected leaders in Arizona who are helping to uh, keep this alive here. Okay. Secretary Hobbs, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And when we come back, this stunning video, a suspect right there allegedly ramming his SUV into a police station on purpose. The phony bomb threat and the arrest of an activist causing outrage across the globe over what's being called state-sponsored hijacking, how Belarus is defending the brazen move tonight. But up next, tomorrow marks one year since George Floyd's death shook America. We're on the ground in Minneapolis, and we'll also bring the story of how another city transformed its police department. Could this be an example to others? Stay with us. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source.
Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime. 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Welcome back. Tomorrow will mark one year since the death of George Floyd. His death at the hands of Officer Derek Chauvin led to nationwide protests and a new era of racial reckoning and calls for reform. Let's bring in our Alex Prochet in Minneapolis tonight, who is at George Floyd's memorial. And Alex, set the scene there in Minneapolis, a city that is now set to relive the trauma of last year again as the whole world watches and relives it with them. Hey, Janae, good evening. Uh, I got to say, it is a weird mix of, of emotions here. I mean, we, we hear people around here say all the time, you know, uh, celebrating the one-year anniversary, the one-year anniversary of George Floyd's death. Uh, but then you think about that word anniversary, and often uh, it's used for something celebratory. It's, it's, it's used for something worth celebrating, and, and, and uh, people are saying it, and you understand why they have a hard time saying something different or describing it a different way. Uh, but there's, there's an emotion attached still to, 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 to that incident. There's emotion attached to what the city went through immediately after and also the rebuilding and reckoning that Minneapolis has dealt with uh, in the months since. But uh, you also talk to folks and, and you recognize that, that there are also emotions attached to things worth that they believe are worth celebrating, whether it be uh, the, the verdict in the Chauvin trial, whether it be what's, what's, what's happened here with this autonomous zone. Certainly people have celebrated, certainly some folks have not. And then also, you know, they'll point to some of the change that has come from this George Floyd situation. Uh, 82 laws enacted across 22 states that deal specifically with uh, police reforms and transparency. That's something to celebrate. And you can tell that people here want something to celebrate. There's a basketball game going on over here. We had a big brass band playing behind me. Tomorrow, there's going to be a celebration of life at a park that's been built with music, games, and, uh, and, and art. Uh, but you still recognize that underneath that surface of, of this, this feeling of celebration is the initial act, that, that death of George Floyd just across the street from me. And Alex, George Floyd's family is set to meet with President Biden tomorrow. Is his family hopeful that this moment can go from protest to actual policy changes? Janae, I, I, I don't want to speak for the family, but, but I, I would lean into what's happening tomorrow, right? I mean, this is a meeting with President Biden in D.C. that's private. They're not going there to lobby Congress, right, um, which I think you can kind of glean some things from them. Also, we've heard from lawmakers on both sides that say that they're motivated here. Representative Karen Bass said we're not going to have a deal in time for uh, the one-year anniversary, but we do think that something will be coming very, very soon. And, I mean, I think, you know, the family is holding on to that hope. And, and quite frankly, if you're, if you're Floyd's family, you, you can't afford not to hold on to that hope that, that this will bring about some sort of national change. We, I remember when uh, Floyd's brother uh, uh, came here and dropped to his knees not too far from here, and now, now him and his family have become these ambassadors for police reform. So I, I do think they're hopeful. And, and Alex, you mentioned 82 laws in 22 states, so already some change that has happened. Alex Prochet, thank you so much for joining us tonight.
And as the nation marks one year since the death of George Floyd amid ongoing calls for police reform, ABC's Martha Raddatz traveled to Newark, New Jersey, which in 2016 was mandated by the federal government to undergo reforms to its policing practices. So how have these reforms impacted the Newark community, and do they provide a model for the types of reform that could happen in cities like Minneapolis? Here's Martha Raddatz. The is Newark community activist Damon Durden has spent much of the last decade working to improve his city's relationship between police and its black residents. When you say the police need to understand the community, what haven't they understood? The historical uh, racism that have, has taken place in, uh, through policing. But he thinks there has been progress, helped in part by a legal settlement. That 2016 consent decree allowed the federal government to mandate reforms for the Newark Police Department. After a Department of Justice investigation concluded there was a pattern of unconstitutional stops, searches, arrests, and unreasonable force with a disparate impact on minorities. Newark Public Safety Director Brian O'Hara has Come been at the way. forefront of the department's the reform stop. efforts. We have a community here with people that have been, you know, demanding change in this city around policing literally for decades. It just gave the city uh, the court backing and the mandate to get this stuff done. One possible sign of progress? Newark police made it through 2020 with zero shots fired by officers on duty. Is Newark a success story in terms of police reform? We're not uh, ready to, you know, put a flag in the ground and, and do a victory lap, but I think we've done uh, tremendous work in the city. But racial disparities in Newark's policing persist, with black people still accounting for 84 percent of use of force incidents in the last year. How does yes. that happen after, after yes. these reforms, yeah. after years and years? I think in a lot of ways, police are dealing with the end result of a whole lot of social problems in the city and across the country, right? But it, it's not an excuse at all. It is Wait, just, what does that mean, dealing with a whole lot of social problems across the country? You know, concentration of social disadvantage, you know, historical problems that have been building up for decades. My experience shows something else, that, you know, there's hypervigilance in our communities and that, you know, we're, we're actually looked at differently than other communities. O'Hara, who has worked with Durden over the years, agrees. It does not excuse disparity in any of those statistics, but I think there's a difference between disparity that is based on those social problems versus disparity based on what a particular officer may be doing, which is something we have to look for, and particular police practices that may not be helpful. Now a consent decree could be in store for Minneapolis, the DOJ announcing an investigation into its police department a day after former officer Derek Chauvin's conviction in the murder of George Floyd. That verdict, while welcomed, still leaves some Newark leaders wary of what comes next. And what we saw in Minnesota is not uh, something that happens all over the country. Police don't take the stand against other police officers. That, that just, that's just not the culture of what's going on, and that has to change. Do you see the Chauvin verdict as, as a one-off and things will just return to the way they are? They will if we allow them to. They will if they allow them to. And so that federal oversight is extremely important. Our thanks to Martha Raddatz. Still ahead here on Prime, the cause of that deadly cable car accident in the Alps is revealed, and now prosecutors are looking into charges. The deaf mother of two and her inspiring story of how she never gave up trying to become a college graduate. And Phil Mickelson made history this weekend out on the golf course. We take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, rapper DMX gone but certainly not forgotten, his latest album, will be released this week. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it.
happy is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America. America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored, winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. And now to a win for the ages, as this weekend, golfer Phil Mickelson became the oldest men's player ever to win a major golf championship. Let's take a look by the numbers. 50 years, 11 months, and seven days. That was Mickelson's age Sunday when he clinched his six under par victory at the 103rd PGA Championship. The oldest player to ever win a major, besting a record that had been held up since 1968. The win gives Mickelson six major titles in his career, putting him in an elite club of just 14 golfers to pull off that many wins. And it was his first major title since 2013. The fan favorite known as Lefty didn't win his first major until he was 33 when Mickelson clinched the 2004 Masters in his 13th year on the tour, his first of three Masters wins. But he has zero, count them, no wins in the U.S. Open where he's finished in second place six times, leaving Mickelson just short of a career Grand Slam. Don't don't worry though, he has got plenty of reasons to smile. With $94 million in career winnings, putting him second to only good friend Tiger Woods in all time earnings. And another testament to Mickelson's longevity, his first tour victory three decades ago, back in 1991, when he was just 20 years old, a college junior at the time, is the last time an amateur won a PGA Tour event. And we still have a ton to get here tonight on Prime. The new watchdog report blasting the Trump administration's child separation policy for allegedly deporting some parents before they even had a chance to take their children with them. We'll have more on those findings. And Memorial Day weekend just around the corner, and that means big sales are too. We'll show you some of them. But first, a look at our top trending stories on ABCnews.com. guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Big hug, Rich. We tell all our patients how much they're loved to hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not 
Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. The CDC is reviewing more than a dozen cases of young vaccine recipients who experienced inflammation in the heart. It happened within four days after getting a COVID shot. The rare condition is called myocarditis. Current data shows only one case occurring in more than 5 million vaccinations. Health experts stress there isn't a higher percentage of myocarditis in vaccinated young people than would normally occur in the general population. From my perspective, the risk of, of COVID is so much greater than any theoretical risk from the vaccine. Well, United Airlines is the latest company to offer vaccine incentives, and this one is pretty good. Vaccinated customers have the chance to win a year's worth of travel. From now through June 22nd, any member of United's Mileage Plus loyalty program can upload proof of vaccination on the company's website or app. 30 people will win round trip flights for two anywhere in the world, and five people will win the grand prize of free travel for a whole year in any class of seating. Meanwhile, a report in the Wall Street Journal about the origin of COVID-19 says researchers at a lab in Wuhan, China, fell sick enough to go to the hospital in November 2019 before the virus was publicly known. It's unclear whether they had the virus. However, the secrecy of the Chinese government is fueling speculation that the virus originated in that lab. A suspect is facing attempted murder charges after driving into a police station. New video shows the 24-year-old suspect ramming an SUV into the station in Havere de Grace, Maryland. Police say he had called and threatened to kill officers earlier in the day. Luckily, no officers were injured. An investigation continues into the crash of a cable car in northern Italy. 14 people, including at least one child, have been killed after their cable car plunged down the side in Italy. This happened on Sunday near Lake Maggiore. It's an area very popular uh, with tourists. In fact, this cable car had only just reopened at the end of the pandemic. Among the dead, we understand at least five Israeli nationals. And two children were discovered inside the wreckage alive. They were airlifted to the hospital. One of them, though, sadly died of their injuries later. It's not known how this accident happened. It's thought a cable failed. It then plunged over 60 feet down to the ground below, crashing uh, on the side of the mountain and then rolling down the slope before eventually being caught by the trees. A new watchdog report blasts the former Trump administration's child separation policy at the border. The DHS inspector general found ICE agents deported 348 migrant parents between 2017 and 2018, in some cases not giving them the chance to take their children with them. The findings contradict government claims about parents choosing to leave their children behind in the U.S. Four months after the January 6th insurrection, National Guard members who have been stationed around Washington, D.C. are finally leaving. After nearly five months on duty, 2,149 troops will return home this week. They've been on guard since the Capitol riots on January 6th. The Department of Defense stating that their mission ended Sunday, offering no more requests for extensions. Originally, the Capitol Police asked the Guard to stay past March 12th. Due to the strain on the police force, the Capitol itself will be guarded by Capitol Police, but the complex around the building will remain closed. And we turn now to a shocking story out of Belarus. Lama Hassan is with us now. Lama, yesterday, a Ryan Air flight carrying a top Belarusian activist was forced to land in Belarus after Belarusian air traffic control said there was a, quote, potential security threat on board. That activist, 26-year-old Roman Predasevich, was taken off the flight and is now detained. What can you tell us about some of the European countries, what they're doing to condemn this incident that many are calling a hijacking?
Yeah, Janae, this truly is a stunning story. The plot sounding like it came straight from a Hollywood movie. So as you can imagine, this has the international community up in arms about it, condemning the, quote, brazen and shocking diversion of this Ryan Air flight and demanding immediate condemnation. European Union leaders have now agreed on new sanctions against Belarus, including a ban on the use of the EU's airspace and airports, and that includes 27 nations. The EU Commission has also called for the immediate release of Roman Protasevich. Now, this wouldn't be the first time that Belarus has faced condemnation from the EU. Belarus's president, Alexander Lukashenko, has already faced sanctions from the EU after crushing last year's protests after he was re-elected, which was a contested victory. Now, here in the UK, even though it's no longer part of the EU, it is hitting back. The Civil Aviation Authority has ordered airlines to avoid Belarusian airspace and has suspended Belarus's national airline from operating here. So tough responses from the EU and the UK. Janae. Yeah, lots of lots of condemnation all around. And we're hearing from, from other passengers. We're learning what Roman Predisevich was, was like in those moments right before he was detained. And do we know where he's being held tonight? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Janae. According to other passengers who were on that flight, Protasevich was visibly distressed when he realized that the plane was headed back to Minsk, the capital of Belarus. Passengers um, were quoted as saying that he began to frantically delete things from his laptop and his phone. And tonight we're being told he is being held in a detention center in Minsk and a pro-government channel posting a video of him the first time that we've seen him since he's been detained. And in the video, he appears to be reading from a prepared speech where he denies being mistreated and says he is cooperating with the investigation. He says he's also confessed to charges of, quote, organizing mass disorders in Minsk, which carries a punishment of up to 15 years in jail. So this story is far from over. Janae. Really alarming story that we will continue to follow. Lama, thank you so much. Well, Memorial Day is just a week away, and that means retailers are gearing up for the summer season and the holiday sales that come with it. Becky Worley has tips on which deals might be worth jumping on and what to wait for. Memorial Day may be a week away, but it's not too early to look for deals. Start shopping now. The big thing is, is that Memorial Day sales have already started. Clothing sales with Buzz right now. The Gap offering 40% off summer wear. American Eagle has $25 off if you spend $100, and Macy's with 25% off summer styles. But it's not just clothes. Walmart kicking off a big sale, including two top-rated robotic vacuum cleaners. This Roomba, $140 off list price. This one from a company called RoboRock, $160 off. Also, Pier 1, which closed physical stores last summer, now revamped for online sales only. We found 20% off wall art and decor. That adds a pop of color. Nice. But to maximize savings... Look for the biggest discounts on things like mattresses, on large appliances, and on clothing, hands down. Those are going to be the biggest things we see discounted. At Mattress Firm, they have this Serta Queen on sale for 50% off, and many online mattress companies discounting 20% or more. Another big-ticket opportunity, appliances. At the Home Depot, this LG Smart Refrigerator is already marked down 25%. But what about shipping delays? Consumers shopping online have been seeing week-long or even month-long delays for a range of products. So what does that mean for Memorial Day deals? If you're shopping online, there's a chance that you could encounter some shipping delays. If that's something you're worried about, it's definitely a good opportunity to shop in-store if you can. Plus, you get that instant gratification of having it right then rather than having to wait for it to be delivered. But some economists say now might not be the best time to make purchases on some of these big items. With shortages and inflation, prices are at historical highs, like this washing machine. It's listed on sale at multiple sites for about $656. But in 2019, this exact same machine sold for $479. That's almost $200 less. Our thanks to Becky. It is graduation season. So many in recent weeks have been celebrated not only for their accomplishment, but for getting it done in the midst of a pandemic. But for one mother who just got her diploma, her journey began decades ago. Faith Abube has her story. A warm hug between student and chancellor. 
the smiles and laughter, hiding the story of the long and arduous journey here. Michelle Randolph has been dreaming of this special moment since she started her undergraduate career in 2018 at 47 years old. I worked really hard for this. I worked really hard. A mother of two, now a University of North Carolina Charlotte graduate. It was great to be able to hear out here. I could finally hear everything. For the ramparts we watch. Michelle was born legally deaf and by the age of 12 lost all of her ability to hear. But today, every word spoken on that stage coming through clear as day. To prepare for the dramatic shift in the higher education landscape. Nearly four decades ago, Michelle couldn't have dreamt of this moment. Well, I was in middle school the day that I lost my hearing. I can pinpoint the day, I don't remember the date, but I remember what it felt, felt like when my ears just popped and just were gone. At 12 years old, the newly deaf middle schooler knew no formal sign language. The dawning reality would prove a challenge in more ways than one. It was kind of hard when I got invited to sleepovers or going to the movie, I always declined because how do you explain that to another teenager that hey, I can't hear, and I don't know what's normal. To me, I was normal. Normalcy in its purest form. Michelle didn't let the hardships push her down. Instead, pressing ahead. Oh, we did it. You did it. We did it. You did it. I basically raised both of my children while deaf. My oldest one had to grow up fast. She did all the doctors, phone calls, everything for mommy. Her youngest daughter, Miracle, was born prematurely with cerebral palsy, autism, and a severe brain injury. Say thank you, doctor. Very good. Thank you, doctor. Oh, you're very welcome. Raising her, it was easy because she was my child. And she helped me through a lot. She helped me through the last two years of schooling because by seeing her, I knew that I could do this. In 2019, Michelle finally became a candidate for a cochlear implant. When I had my cochlear implant surgery, it took maybe three or four months before they actually activated me. When they activated me and I can hear their voices, I was amazed at how I imagined them to talk was actually how they spoke. It was just amazing. It was like a light bulb clicked for me. And I knew then that there was nothing, nothing anymore that, there, that I could not do. But amid the celebration, life wasn't done throwing one curveball after another and Michelle. I lost my husband months after losing my grandmother, so it was really hard. <sighs> I wanted to give up a lot. I, I, I really wanted to just stop going to school. But Michelle didn't, not even as she fought for her own life after an emergency surgery to repair a gallbladder operation gone wrong. 67 staples in her stomach and six months of intensive care, she kept going. And I came back to University of North Carolina in Charlotte on a walker and oxygen that same week um, of my grandmother passing. It was extremely hard, but coming back to school and seeing the support that UNC Charlotte gave me, from every professor, every organization that I'm in, they stood beside me. Today, Michelle sits here on the shoulders of those who lifted her up, even through the dark times. I graduated today to honor them because they would not want me to stop. Head high, proud of herself, as she walks across the stage, grabbing her diploma a year early at 50 years old. Sunshine after the rain, I could say. That's what Sunshine after the rain. Reality. Felt good to be able to hear my name called. Faith Abube, ABC News, Washington. Our thanks to Faith for such an inspiring story. Before we go tonight, the image of the day. Members and cast of the charitable fundraising show Broadway Bears performed during a video shoot called Twerk From Home. Titles aside, or maybe titles included, all these people so close together as the theater industry starts to ramp back up is yet another sign that things are starting to return to normal, and thank goodness for that. That's our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Janae Norman, in for Lindsay Davis. Have a good night.
And coming up in the next hour, we're staying on top of a number of stories, starting with what's being called state-sponsored hijacking. The White House condemns it, and the EU just sanctioned it. Martha Raddatz will bring us the latest on the brazen arrest by Belarusian officials that led to this. And how some nations are using influencers to revive their tourism-reliant economies. We'll travel to one such country. Stay with us. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. I'm Janae Norman. Thanks for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Secretary of State Blinken announced he'll be traveling to Israel to ensure the ceasefire between Israel and Hamas holds. In a tweet, Blinken also said the U.S. is focused on the road ahead, including steps to create a better future for Israelis and Palestinians. The recent 11-day war led to the deaths of over 200 Palestinians and over a dozen Israelis. With the Olympics just a little less than two months away. Today, the U.S. added Japan to the do not travel COVID advisory list. Japan is currently battling another wave of COVID and its government is deciding whether they should extend their state of emergency, which is set to expire on Monday. The U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee released a statement saying they felt confident that the current mitigation practices in place for athletes and staff, coupled with testing before and after arriving to Japan, will allow for safe participation by Team USA. The CDC announced they're looking into a possible link after more than a dozen people, mostly teens and young men, came down with heart issues after getting the COVID vaccine. The condition appeared about four days after the second dose and usually went away on its own. So far, half of all Americans have received at least one shot. Doctors continue to stress that the benefits of immunization far outweigh the risks. And now to news out of Las Vegas tonight. A military plane crashing into a neighborhood near Nellis Air Force Base outside Las Vegas. Let's bring in our Alex Perez. And Alex, what do we know so far? Well, Janae, still a lot of unanswered questions at this point, but just a frightening situation in this neighborhood in Las Vegas after this aircraft came crashing down. Now, I want you to take a look at some of the latest images, what we're seeing right now. Investigators are rushing to the scene of the wreckage. We believe a military plane, possibly from the nearby Nellis Air Force Base, crashed into a residential neighborhood just a short time ago in Las Vegas. Now, the base did release a statement on Twitter saying, we are aware of an incident involving an aircraft associated with the base. Now, Janae, it remains unclear at this point if there are any injuries, but authorities are there on the scene right now trying to figure this all out. Janae? A really terrifying situation. Alex, thank you for bringing us the very latest. Now to the promising signs to slow the pandemic here in the U.S. and perhaps the most normal weekend we've seen in the past year. Our Steve Osinsami reports. This tonight is what the end of the pandemic is starting to look like. For the first time, more than 15,000 fans at a basketball game in Madison Square Garden, the largest indoor event in New York State since the pandemic. People who could prove they were vaccinated didn't need to wear masks. New York, we're here! 
From the NBA playoffs to the links at the PGA Championship, from graduations to parades, the vaccines are helping to get life in America back to normal. It's been a whole year we haven't been able to come out and celebrate. The average number of new COVID cases that were as high as 250,000 a day in January is now below 25,000 new cases a day, a 90% difference. New York State says it will fully reopen public schools in the fall. One million kids will be back in their classroom in September, all in person, no remote. But the CDC tonight says it is investigating reports that a very small number of young people who've been vaccinated have developed a condition called myocarditis, an inflammation of the heart. The symptoms were usually mild, went away on their own, and were seen in more than a dozen teens or young adults, usually men, about four days after getting their second dose of the Moderna or Pfizer vaccine. Doctors are on the lookout tonight for fatigue or shortness of breath, but they point out that these are still only a tiny fraction of the more than 130 million people in this country who've been fully vaccinated without any issues. They are trying to investigate to see if they're related um, at all to the vaccine. At this point, there is no relationship proven. As the world recovers, there are growing calls for a deeper investigation into how the coronavirus got its start. The Wall Street Journal is reporting new details about three workers from the Wuhan Institute of Virology who had to be treated for COVID-like symptoms in November of 2019, about three weeks before health officials believe the outbreak in China began. It's not clear if the three workers actually came down with the disease. Investigators from the World Health Organization have said it's extremely unlikely that the virus spread after a leak from a lab, but they also say that the Chinese government didn't give their investigators full access to information. And I think that we should continue to investigate what went on in China until we find out to the best of our ability exactly what happened. I'm perfectly in favor of any investigation that looks into the origin of the virus. Our thanks to Steve tonight. And tonight, a grieving mother is speaking out after her six-year-old son was killed in a suspected road rage incident in Southern California. Authorities are looking for his killer, as the nation as a whole has seen a surge and uptick in gun violence during the pandemic. Our Rena Roy reports. As the country claws its way out of the pandemic, another deadly epidemic is on the rise. Gun violence growing coast to coast. In New Jersey over the weekend, two people killed, 12 injured after gunfire broke out at a house party. People screaming, hollering, calling the cops, we're calling each other. In South Carolina, a 14-year-old girl fatally shot and 14 others hurt at an outdoor concert. This is sad. Is unfortunate. And near Santa Ana, California, on Friday morning, six year old Aiden gunned down in a possible road rage incident. His killer still on the loose. He was precious. And you killed him. In 2020, nearly 4,000 more Americans died by gun violence compared to 2019, a roughly 25 percent increase. Already this year, the number at least 7,500 so far. There is a guns problem, uh, and that's something the president would say. There are hundreds, thousands of people who lose their lives, and that's one of the reasons the president will continue to advocate for the Senate passing uh, back universal background checks. 120 children age 11 and under have been killed in gun violence, not including suicides so far this year, and 281 wounded, nearly 500 ages 12 to 17 killed, over 1,100 injured. Our thanks to Rena. Overseas now to the country of Belarus, which is facing serious backlash for what leaders of the European Union are calling a brazen hijacking of an airliner. EU leaders have even gone as far as urging all EU-based carriers to avoid flying over Belarus. Martha Raditz brings us the details. It's being called a state-sponsored hijacking, denounced by the White House as a shocking act. The authoritarian president of Belarus ordering this commercial jet to divert and land in order to arrest this passenger, 26-year-old journalist Roman Prostasevich. Prostasevich boarded the Ryanair flight in Athens with some 120 other passengers bound for Lithuania. But when the plane crossed into Belarusian airspace, Local air traffic controllers 
warned the pilots of a potential security threat, directing them to land immediately. A MiG-29 fighter jet launched to escort the plane. Once on the ground, it became clear there was no bomb. Passengers described the journalist, an outspoken critic of the Belarusian president, as frantic and afraid, racing to delete sensitive information and hand off his electronic devices. Roman, stand up. Really open the luggage door, take the luggage, and was trying to split the things, like computer, give it to a girlfriend. Passengers were taken off, including three suspected Belarusian intelligence agents. Prostasevich and his girlfriend were arrested. Tonight, a video of the young journalist in detention in Belarus saying he is in good health but likely under duress or forced to confess to organizing previous mass disturbances. And Martha Raddatz joins us now from Washington. Martha, have you ever seen anything like this before? You know, Janae, I really think this is unprecedented to have a commercial airliner brought down to have a journalist arrested using this incredible ruse, even in an authoritarian country. Never seen anything like it. Yeah, and we know that the U.S. is condemning this and word that the European Union has also taken action. Uh, they have. The EU has agreed on new sanctions against Belarus, including a ban on the use of EU airspace and airports. And I really don't think too many airplanes will be going over Belarus again for a while, Janae. Yeah, but we know this story is far from over. Martha, thank you so much. The world is slowly trying to reopen back up, and lawmakers are being forced to come up with creative methods to jumpstart things. This is especially true in nations that are heavily reliant on tourism. Our team followed a group of social media influencers dispatched by one government on a mission to get people back out there. Ashin Singh has more. If these guys partying in the Bahamas makes you miss pre-pandemic jet setting, well, that's kind of the point. Twelve influencers with a combined reach of more than 16 million followers. And this is their job, to bring you the highlight from the world's most exotic places. Taking a little private jet today. Right to your social feeds, with the goal of getting you to book a trip of your very own. It's time for some dolphins. And now, as the pandemic reaches this new phase of reopening, and Americans debate when to take that first big trip, these influencers are like digital travel agents, working to restart economies decimated by the lack of travelers. From inside the U.S. to paradise abroad. I think that we make a huge impact as far as bringing tourism to all these places that need it, especially after COVID. But with the pandemic still looming, questions about variants and mask mandates are the topics of discussion heading into the summer. Fully vaccinated people can contract COVID, but I would like to emphasize that this is exceedingly rare. And the debates about vaccine passports, not to mention the inconsistent guidelines from destination to destination, are at center stage. It is confusing when the CDC comes out and says for vaccinated Americans, you know, it's safe to travel. And then the next week, the State Department says, but there's 160 countries you shouldn't travel to. While some are weary about traveling again, these influencers are hellbent on getting tourists back to the streets and the industry back on its feet safely. In the Bahamas, Jay Rich is leading his latest excursion, a content creation trip for a group of influencers he manages. It's all a part of his brainchild, Project FOMO. We're working nonstop. We all combine and we create experiences and activities, not just your typical travel photo. Jay helped create Project FOMO in the midst of the pandemic after he says the Maldives government reached out saying they needed some help. I link up with the tourism boards. Uh, you know, I try to create uh, travel viral videos. It's, it's the new modern way to bring in tourism. Creators like Jay essentially work in partnership with tourism boards both locally and abroad, depending on the level of engagement the influencer gets. That's how many followers and likes they receive. A destination will compensate their travel at certain levels or even pay them in order to post something like this. So how much can someone like yourself actually stand to make on a trip like this? On a trip like this, you could probably make like a few hundred thousand dollars. And then if you if you tap into the government, then you can get up there to the 
million dollar million dollar mark and that's when it's really nice <laughs> wait you said you could make as much as a million dollars on a trip like this uh, yeah you could yeah very much so influencers have a huge impact in getting people comfortable traveling people want to see firsthand and this is where i go this is where i show my test because reading a government notice on a website of the rules is much different than seeing someone that you followed for years go through the process themselves do you think you guys showing up for a project fomo trip is actually helping these economies get back on their feet. When you come out and you're able to um, show people so many things to do, so many eyeballs and all across social media platforms, it's better than any billboard, it's better than any advertisement possible. The tourism industry is finally starting to see an uptick, but globally, it took a $935 billion hit in the past year. When they stopped all flights, I was just thinking, well, how is this gonna turn out? That obligation to the travel industry, a big reason why influencer Ana Linares, aka Ana New York, says she made it a point to get back on the road. Do you feel a responsibility to help bring this industry back? I do because I've seen the struggle from the hotel industry and everyone from people in airlines that have lost their jobs. And I think that's exactly why I decided to be here. We followed her to Las Vegas, to the Bellagio, for a trip sponsored by the city's tourism board. They want her Instagram account of 190K followers to help show it's safe to come back to Sin City. Las Vegas was one of the hardest hit American cities in 2020. With over 42 million visitors a year pre-pandemic, they lost over $6 billion when they were forced to shut down. How do you make sure that you're not only keeping yourself safe when you're traveling, but that you're actually keeping your followers safe too. And I think having that platform allows me to just educate people on what's the reality, what not to be afraid of, how hotels are um, responsibly doing everything in their power to make sure that you are safe in your rooms, in the restaurants that you go, transportation everywhere. Experts tell us that traveling domestically may actually be the right idea this summer. Probably still overall, domestic travel is going to be safer than uh, international travel. We know that almost 40% of the U.S. population now is fully vaccinated. Our case numbers are uh, ticking down day by day. As the numbers increase of those who have been vaccinated, experts are saying the debate over whether to introduce a vaccine passport is the next step in the world fully opening up. It may end up being the case that some countries uh, eventually require some proof of uh, vaccination against the COVID to be able to come into their country. What's your biggest concern moving forward as Americans start to feel more and more comfortable uh, traveling? The U.S. government cannot confirm if anyone actually got the vaccine. This is going to pose a challenge with international travel, fraud, with vaccination cards. Regardless of the guidelines, doctors, influencers, and experts alike will tell you the same thing. Be safe and don't do anything until you're ready. So I would say go at your own pace, do your own research, make sure you, your family, and your friends are safe. If anything, the past year has taught these jet setters not just about the privilege of travel, but they say it's about truly savoring the people and places that come with it. I had to think of places that were within distance of me to go and discover and create new content. Pre-pandemic, it was all about trying to hit as many destinations as possible. Now, I hope people actually savor travel and take more meaningful trips. We always talk about all the deaths and everything in COVID, but we also have to talk about how many families and people are starving now because of the lack of tourism. Do you feel like you're helping? I always feel like I'm helping. I'm a giver. I'm always, I've always been a giver, and I always will be a giver. He said he could make about a million dollars for traveling, and I'm realizing I may have chosen the wrong profession. Still to come, the duly elected female leader locked out of her office and her male predecessor who refuses to leave the post he no longer holds. And Brooke Shields sits down with us to talk about her remarkable road back to health. Stay with us.
With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. There's nothing better than getting together with friends. And the wait is finally over. Now, tomorrow on GMA. I don't think that any of us had any idea how emotional we would be. The reunion the world's been waiting for. And the first TV interview. I got a lot of, you're the best of all the guys. And what made Jennifer Aniston say this? I don't yes. even know if I've ever said that in an interview, ever. Tomorrow morning. To see them all together again, uh, it's magic. On ABC's Good Morning America. Good Morning America. Mike Tyson was called the baddest man on the planet because he was the baddest man on the planet. There were three black men who ruled the world. Michael Jordan, Michael Jackson, Mike Tyson. The only question was, which Mike do you want to be? <laughs> Mike Tyson in the ring, he was unbeatable. But outside the ring... The climb, the crash, the comeback. If you could talk to 20-year-old Mike, what would you say to him? It's gonna hurt. The Knockout premieres Tuesday night, May 25th on ABC. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for Overall Excellence in Television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast, 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights, The View, the number one daytime talk show, and ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. We're tracking several international headlines at this hour. Myanmar's ousted leader made her first in-person court appearance earlier today since her arrest back in February. She was removed by the military after her party won in a landslide victory. The military claims her win was the result of a widespread election fraud. Her supporters say her arrest is politically motivated and an attempt to discredit her, all in an effort to legitimize military rule in Myanmar. 14 people, including a child, died in Italy after a cable car crashed into the ground in northern Italy Sunday. The cable car fell 65 feet before rolling several times. Another child remains in serious condition. The victims were of Italian, Israeli, and Iranian descent. The Minister of Sustainable Infrastructure announced a commission which will be set up to find out what happened. And Samoa's first female leader was locked out of parliament for what was supposed to be her swearing in in first day of her new government. Samoa's previous prime minister, who had been in power for 22 years, held a news conference claiming he and his government remain in charge. The elected female leader called the move a, quote, bloodless coup. 
A number of businesses are struggling to fill positions, but there's debate over why. Is it because of government unemployment benefits being too generous? The transformation of the job market during the pandemic being far greater than analysis than analysts are taking into account or something else. No matter the reason, businesses are being forced to get creative if they want to attract the best employees. Deirdre Bolton has more. Laid off workers are in a pinch. When you have five weeks worth of bills, that's added up. Danielle Anderson is a furloughed Ford auto factory worker waiting to be recalled. She receives unemployment benefits, but the payments are behind. I've waited this long, you know, already. Gasoline is expensive. I'm about five weeks behind on the car payment. Some states are cutting unemployment benefits starting next month. Critics arguing those payments are a disincentive to people going back to work. That perhaps is a, a misguided perception of what's really going on in terms of the labor market. In Danielle's case, she is on hold until her Ford factory gets a shipment of semiconductor chips that go into the cars that she helps to put together. Always worked one or two jobs. I love the people that I work with. Experts say there are numerous reasons for people not going back. Number one is probably the virus and the health situation. Number two, you also have child care issues, which are still not addressed. Number three, you also have the fact that a lot of older individuals took early retirements during the pandemic. Workers are challenged and so are businesses. Erica Simino manages Colombo's, a popular restaurant on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. She says the restaurant owners are offering $100 incentive bonuses, even adding a 401k program. These are um, incentives that this business has never seen before. Small businesses are not alone. Amazon aiming to hire 75,000 employees and offering some of them $1,000 signing bonuses. McDonald's, Chipotle, Target, Costco agreeing to raise wages or offering signing bonuses for workers. Even Uber and Lyft are giving out cash bonuses for referring new drivers. Some chains like Taco Bell, CarMax and IHOP have held job fairs to bring in new recruits. Our thanks to Deirdre. Now to Brooke Shields, talking for the first time about her challenging recovery after a gym accident that left her wondering if she would ever walk again. Deborah Roberts sat down with her. It sounds like you're saying the ordeal has been kind of a blessing. I think it's almost been the biggest blessing to date because I realize what a fighter I am. For Brooke Shields, the journey started as she was nearing an ending. It was late January. The 55-year-old actress, model, and beauty icon was in top form, finishing the 13th day of a 14-day workout plan. There you go. I was energized. I wasn't exhausted. I had been eating even healthier you were and in the not zone. drinking. I was in the zone and never dreaded it. And I, we finished the workout, and I went in the back um, on my own, and I went on this balance board. And then you have to balance. And um, a young man had said, oh, that looks really hard. And I said, you know, it's only really as hard as you commit to, to learning it or doing it. And I turned back, which you just, you never take your focus off. And, and I flew up in the air with such force and I landed so heavy and so hard and with such musculature and such velocity and such height. Um, on your leg? On my hip, on the top part of my femur. And it just snapped it. Did you know right away? Did you hear the break? I felt the, how solid the impact was. I didn't remember hearing anything. The only thing I could keep saying was that I could feel my toes because I just knew that I couldn't move, but I wanted to make sure I wasn't paralyzed. And I kind of came to, I mean, inches away from hitting my head on a, on a, um, a weight bench. Mm. I mean, there's so many things that could have happened that just, I feel so lucky. I feel so lucky to be alive. What was going through your mind? I, I don't know, remember how I was. I mean, I just started screaming. I was just screaming, and it was, I, I've never screamed like that. I mean, not even in childbirth. <laughs> Paramedics quickly got her to a hospital. Brooke was rushed into surgery to insert two metal rods near her hip. 
The next day, she recalls waking up in excruciating pain. I had to get rushed back into surgery because my bone had popped off the device because it hadn't, it wasn't anchored. With five more rods and a metal plate, she thought her healing was about to begin. Then another scare, an infection in her arm at the site of her IV. Once fear kind of kept in, that's when I started to falter. I think that's when I called you. <laughs> you and I, in fact, let's talk about that. You and I have known each other a little while, and we just happened to be emailing when you were in the hospital, and I called you, and I couldn't believe it. And there you are by yourself, too. How frightening was this for you, Brooke? I don't think I've ever been more afraid because I was helpless. She spent two lonely weeks in the hospital. No visitors, not even family allowed because of COVID restrictions. How did your family react? I had to stay calm for them because I was never coming home. You know, and then the one time I did come home, I got rushed back in to the hospital for them to do surgery on the infection, which ended up being a staph infection. My kids actually asked me if they thought I was gonna die. Bad boy and good boy. Good boy. After another two weeks in the hospital, she was able to go home. What is your rehab like? I'm having to work very hard. I'm doing it every day. I'm usually taking off on the weekends, but I'm also getting osteopath work and I'm getting massage and um, infrared sauna. I made it downstairs today by myself. Brooke Shields has found strength by documenting her journey on social media, offering hope to others who may be on their own difficult journey. If I can turn it into anything positive or I can teach my girls, yeah, stuff's going to happen in your life and how you respond is going to define you and adversity will reveal you. It won't make you as much as it will reveal you. Adversity will reveal you. That's interesting. Because you see who you are. You see what you're made up of. Then you think like, wow, I, I think I need to share this. I need, especially women, I, I want them to know that, that they deserve to feel good about themselves and be healthier and happier and bigger, live a bigger life. For Good Morning America, Deborah Roberts, ABC News, New York. Adversity will reveal you. Our thanks to Deb for that piece and for Brooke, to Brooke Shields for sharing her story. That is our show for tonight. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Janae Norman in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks for streaming with us. Good night.